three, two, one, and we are live. What's up, CP family? Chad here with Andrew joining us for the tiebreaker series 106. Hope everyone's doing great. We're going to have a conversation tonight about a common topic that we, we, we talk a lot about it. A lot of people talk about it a lot, and that's uh, you know being in the moment, being present. Uh, it's a common term that's thrown around. A lot of athletes know that that's what they should be doing, at least while they're playing. That it's it's commonly talked about, but I don't know if everyone has uh, has a, a great understanding of what that actually means, what that actually is, and and how to obtain it like even more often. So. To kick this off, I want to ask you, Andrew, what what does it mean to you to be in the present moment and for you personally? And then maybe back that up with a specific time where you were playing in your athletic career where you really felt present. You really felt in the moment. Like what what were some of the things happening? How did you know that you were really present? How did you know that you were in the moment when you were actually playing? Because for those of you who don't know, Andrew, super high-level athlete. He was a soccer player, played semi-professional soccer, uh, Division One for a top, you know, nationally ranked soccer school. Took that sport to a really high level, and um, I know you you lean on some of those experiences, obviously, when you're talking to our athletes. So, what what does it mean to you to be present moment with regards to like athletes and and playing sports and stuff like that, and then um, what, what's a, maybe a, a story or a time or a practice or a situation or a moment where you really felt kind of dialed in and w- what was that all about? Well, it's hard to define presence because it, it, I feel like it's above the mind. It's above how we think. So a lot of times, like if you're thinking about what you're doing, like in terms of cause and effect, like I'm going to do this to get that, we're, that's a good sign that you're not necessarily present. Mm-hmm. So if you're thinking about the past or you're thinking about the future or you're using that, like you're using your understanding of the past and you're using your understanding of what you think you need, want the future to be, if you're doing that, you're not present. So presence is almost like this, um, it's like what's left over once you remove the barriers to being present. So it's not like in and of itself like this thing, it's this thing that's there all the time. We always have access to it, but we've layered all of these things on top of it um, from these destination mindsets where we're lost in the future to these victim mindsets where we're attached to identities in the past. Um, Why I think it's so challenging is I I feel like it's, um, I feel like being completely present is like Think of still water and think of thoughts as you're moving through the water. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about stuff, you're moving through the water, but that muddies the water up and the mud starts, the dirt starts to come up and then things aren't as clear and that can be really frustrating. You don't know where where you're going in the future. You don't know like what's holding you back. And this, that's kind of um, relatable to like super frustrating times and our, everyone's initial reaction to that situation, especially athletes, and is effort. We need to apply more effort to the situation. Mm-hmm. That is almost always never the solution. If you are watching this, if you're in CP Elite or if you're a relatively high-level athlete, a lot of times it's more effort is not the solution, especially it's, I mean, it's always, it's never the solution when it comes to the mental game. The mental game is always, can we, can we, how can I try less? It's this trying of, it's trying to control the situation is what makes you not present. So the solution when you're in that muddy water is it's almost like we're trying to flatten the water by rubbing our hands over it. It's just going to make the water, it's just going to make everything more muddy. And that's super frustrating because you're like, I'm trying as hard as I can to, for things to clear up and to be present. And that's like, we're stuck in this trying game. Mm-hmm. And like, if you, if you feel like you're trying, that's a good sign. You're not on the pathway to being present. <laughs> you yeah. have, to, it's the absence of trying is what will result in presence. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people will correlate the presence to kind of this flow state. And there's one, there's one memory in particular um, where I felt like I was really in a flow state. 
And so when I, when I was playing at FIU, I was hitting a couple barriers as a freshman, like with confidence and how I'm adjusting to playing in, in college and the dynamics different. It's just every, it, I was not used to it. And it kind of took a while for me to, to start to handle the mental game. And so the whole fall season went by, which is the main season, then we're into spring. And there was one spring game in particular. I was so fed up with how I was playing. Uh, I would play really good in the, in, the mat, in the practice, and then I wouldn't play good in the matches. And there was this one spring game, um, I, I forget who we were playing, but um, the day before the coach was like, um, I would maybe start half the games in the fall season, so like, he was like, you're, you're starting this, this game, and I was like, okay, sweet, I'm starting. And I was like, I'm just going to completely remove my understanding of the past. I'm going to pretend that I just got beamed into my body right now, and I'm just going to go out here like I'm eight years old and I'm going to play soccer like I know how to play soccer. And I scored a hat trick in the first half. And like it, were, it was three of the most absurd goals I've ever scored in my entire life. And it was just like it almost felt like a dream. And the biggest difference I can say was I, was, I, I just wanted the ball rather than trying to figure out, trying to be in the perfect position where it's like maybe in tennis you're trying to set up like the perfect shot and things just aren't working out. And rather than just like, I want every single ball that comes my way, I want it. And they just go after it. You just almost lose this whole game in your head of, of trying to decipher and f- navigate a match. It, it, I just completely got rid of that and just complete, 100% went with, went with what I knew. And so it kind of like completely forgot the past and, and kind of went in this timeless mode. You know, I like to think of, I don't even, it's not even that I like to think of, being in the present moment is outside of time. Time is this illusion that we've created in our mind. Your understanding of your past and your understanding of what you think your future is, it only exists in one place. It only exists in your mind. That's it, besides historical fact. Okay, and so when we are present, we, we exit that mind time dimension where mm-hmm. we get ourselves into trouble. That's really where we get ourselves in trouble. All confidence, the mind's in the past. All anxiety, the mind's in the future. Those are the main two things that are wrong. I either don't feel like I'm capable or I'm very anxious or nervous for something. Those are both byproducts of not being present. So yeah, that's, that's definitely... Um, I think I remember that game. It was one of the goals like top of the like top of the eighteen yard, like straight on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I remember I, the that third game. one was I chipped the keeper with my left foot. Okay, too. yeah, <laughs> I was I was actually at that game. I remember that. That was crazy. Yeah, that was epic. That was epic. Um, but for you, I know you've been reading some books recently that have a lot to do with the present moment, and my question for you is, what have you found? are your main pitfalls to being present? Like what, what are the things where it's like you catch yourself not being present if you had to pinpoint something or if it was while you were doing something? What was the main blockage or the main interruption from you remaining present as often as possible, either during the, um, just during the day or maybe under a, a more stress situation, like if you're if you're doing a session with an athlete, something where you're actually, you know, yeah, under the gun. Absolutely. Um, I think the number one pitfall for me was I didn't realize it was a pitfall until I started to gain a little bit more awareness, and then I pin pinpointed this pitfall, and that pitfall was finding myself in a reactionary state. So something happens and I just react to it. Something happens and I just react to it. And that sounds good, but when you're reacting to something, you're not consciously basically choosing how you want to react to it. You're just, you're, you're kind of on autopilot. And so autopilot is a good, it's, it's very efficient. Our humans do a great job being on autopilot and they get a lot of stuff done because you, you're not thinking about your breathing that's going on automatically along with millions of other things are going on automatically. But when it comes to the actual activity you're doing at that moment, you don't want to be on autopilot. And I realized that I'm on autopilot and I'm in this reactionary state a lot. And that's a telltale sign that you're reacting because your head's not in the moment. It's in the past or it's in the future. You are now not in the moment. You're in this 
reactionary or even compulsive state of being. And so I just put some awareness on that and it really um, helped me to slow everything down, be a little bit more conscious because the way I see it is you, you can either be reacting to something which you may not have as much say in that reaction as you think you do. It's maybe, it might be dictated by a lot of previous experiences and habits and patterns and stuff like that. And if you're not reaction, if you're not reactionary, that means you're conscious and you're picking, you're choosing how to respond the way you want to respond. And so this is an ability that you can actually develop. And one way I've been doing this with my athletes and with you and with myself is the ice baths that we take, the cold plunges that we take. When you go into ice water, you are going to have reactions that you're not in control of. Your body is going to freak. It's going to say, because it knows for 100% fact that if you stay in this for a certain amount of time, that's not a lot of time, you are going to die. That's what's actually being communicated to your body. And your body is very intelligent and knows that for 100% fact. So, so it's telling you, get out. But us as athletes, we're trying to do the ice bath for other reasons. We're trying to recover our muscles or we're trying to work on our thought processes or, or something like that. And so what do you do to overcome an automatic response, an automatic reaction? Well, the key is to insert some space and some time between this automatic response. Now it gives you room to be a little bit more conscious with how you are reacting to it. And so if you're consciously reacting, you are 100% in the moment. And so just with this awareness, I've realized that 99% of my day is just reaction. And you need to, we need to, I, I personally need to start chipping away at this. And it makes me a better trainer. It makes me a better trainer, especially because I'm working with a lot of athletes. And a lot of them are working on the same things. And we're, I, I can do some of these sessions in my sleep. I'm sure you've had some sessions where you've done the same session hundreds of times which is great because you know it like the back of your hand. But I might be missing something if I'm not super present, like slowing down, not just reacting to questions, really thinking about it, giving a conscious response to it. How, how do you chip away at your reactions? Like how do you make sure you're not reacting, but don't replace that with trying? How, how, how have you managed that balance so it doesn't go in the other direction and now you're just trying and that's actively using the mind and not necessarily being present it's not necessarily a trying thing it's more just adding space and time which isn't really trying it's more of like not trying it's more of slowing down a little bit so that's like the opposite of trying trying is pushing something forward and so what you really want to do is just slow down a little bit and so you basically just in increase your awareness, slow down. So a, a big thing is how you can really catch it is with emotions. So emotions bubble up. That's usually a reaction. And so let's say you're emotional and now you need to say something. Let's say uh, someone makes you angry, emotion comes up, and now you need to communicate. Well, just add space and time and don't communicate right then and there. Like it sounds, e it sounds, it's like an age old advice, like count to 10 when you're angry. That's what I'm talking about here. Count to 10 all the time. Count to 10 when you're in the ISO hold lunge. Keep on doing it till you hit five minutes. Count to 10 when you hit the ice water. Count to 10 when it's just, you, you just need some more space and time. And then you realize that this reaction that was trying to come in without you really wanting it to, you, you blocked it, and so now you get to choose, and you're, you're going to choose the right thing. You're going to choose to be, to handle it properly. No one wants to be angry. Like, if you think you want to be angry, try being angry for 24 hours straight, and you'll come to the, you'll come to the conclusion that that's impossible, and you don't actually want to do that. So if you're angry, you're not in the moment. You're reacting. So this is just, an, so I... My practice, I guess, is with emotions, and sometimes that makes me seem like I don't have any emotions, but that's what I'm really trying to do. I'm really trying to say, like, is this a reaction or is this consciously how I want to do it? And so it's just a catching thing. And then I think a key point when it comes to not trying is 
just increase awareness and don't judge yourself when you screw up because the judgment is what kicks into the trying. But if you're not going to judge yourself on the tail end of it, then there's not really as much pressure to try. And you know that this is just a process that the entire population is dealing with. You know, <laughs> I'm telling you, everyone, everyone, I, you see it, you see it all the time on the tennis court. People reacting left and right. They're not consciously throwing their racket. No mm -hmm. way they're consciously Which throwing is their interesting racket. because the nature of the sport makes them judge more. They're losing and w they, there's this immediate feedback every 30 to the 60 seconds that I lost or I won that, that point. That's literal data that is so readily and easily judged that we can almost boom and we say, well, what does this now mean? Oh, it means I'm a point closer to winning the game or a point, oh, what if I, what if I lose? And we start going off into the future. Having these things, the nature of, the, of tennis makes it so judgeable. So it's interesting that you mentioned the judging. That's a crazy dynamic of the sport. It's also completely anti getting in flow. Flow is a real thing. Like we talk about athletes getting in flow and we've experienced it growing up. You, you talked about that game and, you know, I've had times in, uh, playing sports or even uh, learning how to fly an actual airplane. For those of you who don't know, I'm actually a pilot. Uh, so learning how to fly, like you get into these, these flow, flow states and I didn't know that, that was a word and I didn't know that was a thing. But that's actually a, psycho uh, a psychologist by the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, the father of flow, he studied his whole life on, the, on these flow states. And it's these states that you get in, and we've talked about it before, but judgment and like analyzing that quickly, like you miss the point, you miss the ball, that knocks you out of flow. So, for example, it's, ex it's much harder, scientifically, much harder for a tennis player to get into flow than for a soccer player or a basketball player. The game by nature is more flowy. Now... The guys that have mastered it are the guys like Roger Federer that you don't see get upset. That guy gets in flow much more than other people. Uh, but the nature of the game with the win-lose every single point really does not help the, the cause for flow. And that's why you got to detach from results. So you probably have a way to relate to this. Being a, being a soccer player, I mean, I played tennis but I mainly played soccer you're you're exactly right it's very it's much easier to get lost in the game the ball doesn't even go out of bounds that often you the game is just constantly happening so it seems to be when things are on the line judgeable events are occurring and there could potentially be consequences to those things seems to be a big flow block so being in the military especially in your training where they had the way they trained you is that they didn't teach you how to do it they had you do it, fail at it, and then taught you how to do it. How did, how were you able to stay present knowing that this is like my actions have serious consequences here? Like, how do you not let your mind go too far into the unknown, worrying about things that you can't control and really being able to stay present and yeah. making a decision with speed? Absolutely. So... You're right, that judgment thing is a flow blocker, but the consequences on the line isn't a flow blocker. And actually, um, the athletes that get into flow the easiest are extreme sports athletes. So, you know, like Sean White on the snowboard half pipe, that guy is in flow. He's in flow way more often than the top tennis players. Because if he's not in flow, he's actually going to die. Like a lot of people think these guys are adrenaline junkies. They actually aren't adrenaline junkies. They don't excrete, if that's the right word, excrete. <laughs> what I, they don't, there's no adrenaline in their system. If there's adrenaline in their system, something went real wrong and they're not able to perform. You don't perform well when you got adrenaline pumping through your system. So they're actually in flow. They're flow junkies. They love being in flow. And it's that um, real bodily harm consequences on the line is actually a flow trigger. That's why one of the activities we do with our athletes sometimes to get them in flow is we uh, play catch with kettlebells because just the thought of that kettlebell dropping on your foot clicks, it, it cages your attention a little bit more 
so you're forced to be in the moment because your body knows that there's some con real consequences on the line. So that's actually a float trigger. So there's no body harm on the line in tennis. So the judgment there is really working against the players. But with real consequences on the line, it's definitely a float trigger. But mm -hmm. so with consequences on the line, obviously in military training, um, if you're not if, if you're in the real thing, there's severe severe consequences on the line. Um, when you're when you're in training. There's not that, but they, that's what you're training for, and you know you're training for that. And there's ways where they make you feel like that with the realis realism of the training and stuff like that. So really, to answer your question, I, I, would, I would like to say that I came up with these amazing tactics and like procedures and tricks of the trade, but really, you are going to fail out of the tr training if you just don't figure out a way to do it. The way... You have to make decisions the way you're getting graded and you're getting through the training and stuff like that. There's really no other way to do it. Um, if you're thinking about the future too much in training, you are going to fail the training and you're going to quit. And that's why the biggest advice when people go through military training is like take it one minute at a time and take it like one cycle at a time. Take it one, like, you don't even think about what's going on, like, the next day or even later on that day. You're trying to make it to lunch or, or whatnot. So the training really forces you to do it. And then you realize that your performance really goes up. And so that's something that I really saw firsthand. When I was in flight school, I had to decide, should I sleep? Should I study? Or should I do in the zone? Which one paid off more um, for a flight on the line the next day? So you just... Which one paid off more? Typically, it was sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Studying was definitely not <laughs> the answer. Um, but, yeah, does that answer your question? It's yeah. like, it just for, you're just forced to do it. There's really no other way. You're not going to perform at the minimum standard if you don't do it. It's literally, you're going to get a failing grade because there was too much going on. Flying an aircraft is a very good example because you there's too much going on on when they're teaching you like you they're, you're really overwhelmed to the point that like you, you can't even look out the window for one second because you're checking all the gauges and the heading and all that stuff and you're just constantly checking that like just by design the activity boom you're like mm. really flowy but what was cool was doing all those activities and realizes that your performance goes way up so a tennis player might not believe us when we say your performance is going to go way up when you don't care about the result and you're really engaged in the present moment. Your ability to perform goes way up. It goes way up. A lot of people don't think that. Or maybe they do, but then you got to try it. You got to literally not think about the draw. You got to literally not think about these things. Is this going three sets? Like, um, you know, that's, that's really the trick. Mm -hmm. What, what, do you, what do you see just talking to all these athletes as, um, I know you, you already talked a little bit earlier about some of the pitfalls. Um, what's the most common pitfalls that you see tennis junior players that's preventing them from being in the moment when they're in competition for the players that are coming across? Your yeah, dance? I mean, you, you just hit it on the head with being outcome oriented. It's... If, if you think about it, you were saying it earlier that if you're not present, you don't have the ability to respond. Think about it. If, if everything's happening in the present moment, if you are not present, you're not in the driver's seat. Yeah. You just got to think about that for a second. You're literally not in the driver's seat of the decision maker of, of you when you're not present. So you have to ask, what is? Who's making these decisions? Who's getting angry? Because like you were saying, nobody's consciously saying, I'd like to be angry right now. Nobody wants to be angry. So if anger is coming over you, well, what is that? And what essentially happens is if when we're outcome oriented, when we're valuing the outcome, we're, con we're, we're essentially turning the present moment into the stepping stone, saying this present moment is only useful because I want that thing. So actually all of our attention and part of our identity is linked to this outcome, meaning I won't be good enough or I won't feel good about myself or I'll be a failure if I don't get this outcome. We essentially turn the present moment into a stepping stone to get there. And when you do that, you're not present. And so all of your past patterns 
in, in that you've created in the past are going to respond in that situation. So if, if you get upset when you, when you double fault, because that's happened a lot of times in the past, you double fault. If you don't stay present in that moment, anger comes over you. Anger is now the decision is, is the dominant energy and the dominant decision maker. And you're not going to play as good when you're angry. It's scientifically proven lowers your IQ. Okay. So really when we're outcome oriented for long periods of time, that's really how, why we judge ourselves. So we look back into the past and we say, I didn't measure up to the outcome that I wanted. And it creates, we ask ourselves, well, why did that happen? And we, we begin to create these reasons. Oh, this, like, if I'm trying to win this match and you look back and like, oh, I didn't win that match. Why didn't I win that match? Um, I'm not good at second serves. You essentially created a mental block. It's act, that's how the actual mental block gets created. And we, in our mind, what we're, what we're in trying to do is we're trying to find a legitimate reason why we're experiencing these negative emotions. But really what's happening is we're justifying our emotions. So now when we experience this mental block in the future, it's at, you are giving yourself permission to feel these emotions. That's why those emotions take over you. And that's why it's so hard to... That's why people get knocked out of flow all the time because now... We've, we've analyzed the past so much, especially tennis players. There's just mental blocks scattered over the entire tennis match that you can't go 10 minutes without being triggered by a mental block. And so that's really the challenge. So when you're outcome oriented, it's how you're, that's how you're going to judge yourself. When you judge yourself, when you're outcome oriented, you judge yourself, you're going to come up with problems. And then you begin to define yourself by those problems. And before you know it, you have, you, you're essentially conditioning yourself for limitation. It's essentially what you're doing. You're looking back and you're telling yourself, I'm not good enough. And then you wonder why you have a lack of confidence. You told yourself that you're not good enough. But if we remember, who's to say what's good enough? Who told you that? Who told you you're not good enough? Where does it say that? No, you made it up based upon the outcome that you set for yourself. You made the rules. You fell short of those rules. You decided that you're not good enough. And then you came up with a reason why. So you created a mental block, you created a poor state of being based off being outcome oriented for absolutely no reason. And then that just gets projected and in, into the future and it, it, you constantly getting triggered. And you, it's like you can't, even, you can't even get out of it. You can get out of it, but the answer is to be present. So technically what's happening is, let's say it's that second serve thing and, you, and you're, you, you miss some second serves and anger comes up. You're not going to be able to stop the anger from coming up. That is now built into your nervous system. And you're gonna, it's going to take some work to get that back out. So already, automatically, the anger or the frustration or the annoyance rises a little bit. But if you can stay present during that, meaning I'm just observing the anger that's coming up, I'm not identifying with it. Just observing it, meaning I'm not judging it, which is how it got created. It got created because you judged. And you just simply observe it. You don't identify with it. Technically, that pattern, as soon as it, it only had power because you were like, that's me, I'm angry, I suck at second serves. You identified with it. That's why it's staying with you. That's the hard part of the mental block. If you can observe it and just say, I'm not the one being angry, angry. the anger's just coming up, you're, you're really dissolving that pattern. And so every single, you can like be confident that every single second you're present and it's challenging to be present, you're dissolving past you're dissolving past limitation, past conditioning, and you're rewriting new, new cognitive conditioning. Yeah, that's crazy. So it's, I mean, to, to answer the question simply, it's the outcome orientedness. That is the first thing. It's like, I need, I need something external to feel good about myself internally. It's already over. You're already in a vicious cycle. I need to feel good about myself to get the outcome, but I need the outcome to feel good about myself. I need to feel good about myself to get the outcome, but I need the outcome to feel good. You're already in a vicious cycle. So now you add the problems and the limitation into it. You're just, you're just creating more layers of the onion and surrounding this vicious cycle. Yeah, definitely. I think we'll, we'll end on that. Um, good, good discussion. Yeah, I really awesome. enjoyed that. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it too. Let us know if you got any other topic ideas you want us to cover and we'll hit those up. We'll see you guys next time on the tiebreaker. Thanks guys. Peace.